Okay. It does that like you know how you have that effect where you're oh but we're recording by the way. Is it cool okay. if we just start? Like just yeah. freaking get into it. Let's Joe Rogan it. style. <laughs> yeah. So like your thing does I, I notice on your streams, like it mm -hmm. you can change your face to go from the corner and then you have a split you with your like the guest. Is that part of StreamYards too? Or like how is that a separate thing? Yeah. Uh, so if you ever see me pulling up chats, that's StreamYard. Um, yeah. Other than that, if if I do, I have another setup that like, you know, that I used to run with where yeah. it's like uh, I'll I'll Zoom and then I'll stream that Zoom into OBS and then I'll just like have all my like thinkers or I'll have my um my CNBC pulled up. I'll have uh, Chrome pulled up. I ha I'll have Weeble pulled up and then I'll just like rotate between the three. OK. Uh, I find there's more flexibility with with OBS that way. Like I can macgyver how whatever solution i want but yeah. with Streamyard, it's just like hands off i don't really have to do much i've i've paid for them for about three i think three months now but i've only really used them for one but okay. uh but yeah i think it's worth just like if you're gonna do live interviews yeah it's, it's i think it's worth not having the headache of setting anything up if you're gonna do pre-recorded record edit then it's no big deal anyways i feel like okay do you do you prefer doing them live or do you prefer doing them recorded like what's what's your vibe that's a good question i I prefer doing them live. I've, uh, uh, I prefer doing them live. I think the community okay. likes them um, yeah. live. I think the community likes to interact with the guest. And also, I, th I think there's a degree of like, people want to tune in and see like what's happening uh, live. Yeah. And, like, you know, what's happening with the stock? What ha what's happening with the news? When it's pre-recorded, sometimes it's um, it, it, it can be fine, but it's just, yeah. it just doesn't have that live element. I love to think that like I'm putting on a show. It's like, a, a, you know, like I'm, I'm at the end of the day, like we're entertainers, right? So like, sure. But like, the, I think the community really gets together during an event rather than having it pre-recorded. Um, mm. that's just my thoughts, but, but yeah. Yeah. I mean, that makes sense. Cause I was, I was thinking about like moving towards that too. Like I was, cause all my interviews have been pre-recorded and there's like mm -hmm. a certain thing about that too, because like, I really like the interactivity of like the, the life stuff too. Cause you can check chat, you can check chat and see what they're talking about. And yeah. that gives you like topics to talk about. But then on the recording side too, like what I found, and I haven't tried live, like I've done live streams, but I haven't done mm -hmm. live interviews yet, but I would love to start. Like I was half thinking I'm like, man, should I make this one into a live interview? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, well, the timing of it, like the time that we settled, that's probably not the greatest time to do a live one, right? So, um, but I really like, it almost, it feels very intimate, you know, like mm -hmm. the recordings, cause it's like, it, it's as close as you're gonna get to like a one-on-one -on -one interaction with somebody. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I was trying to do with this channel is like, I'm trying to f like, f like find really smart, great people that I can just connect with and talk with and then see kind of what, how they think about certain topics and and share that with the world, right? And, and like share that conversation with the world because what the, one of the things I'm noticing is like, especially, and this is what I really wanna to talk to you about too, like part of this, because the, the vibe of your channel is so like uplifting. I, that's one of the mm. things that I really enjoy about your, awesome. your channel is like, you can just tell you're a good dude and you're just out there for everyone's like, best interest and you're trying to spread positivity. And yeah. then you live in this world of like, everything just is just seems like it's going down to shitter. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, like, so I'm like curious. No, for sure, dude. And I, honestly, I think that's why you're, you have such a, such a great crowd around you is because your positivity, like how is that something that came naturally to you? Was that part of like your mission statement for the, for the channel? Like, talk to me about that. Cause it's a very clear like thing that you're doing. So I'm, I want to pick your brain on that a little bit. Interesting. Yeah, no, it's, it's always nice to hear that. I appreciate that. It's, it's, um, you know, I, I'm not, uh, overtly, um, like, it, you know, you you kind of meet those people sometimes they are like always positive, no matter what, almost to like a fault. I try mm. not to be like that. Um, you know, I try not to be positive just for the sake of being positive, but to actually yeah. find uh, good in the world. Honestly, the channel, it's, it's an awesome, um, it, it's, it's a really tight new, uh, a tight knit, a group of people that, you know, I see a lot of repeats. I see a lot of people that tune in and they're like, oh, this is my first time, but I'm going to be back for, uh, for the live streams. And I think the positive side of that, I mean, it's so easy online to be sucked into like wanting to do like kind of like one up, one upmanship, right? Like mm -hmm. on Twitter, someone makes an argument. You're like, well, that's a stupid argument. I'm going to rebut and t show the world I'm smarter. Or it's like little things where, you know, you're online, you're always trying to find uh, the kind of the one up. And obviously I'm guilty of it too in my, in my daily life. Everyone is to, to a degree. But I think the channel, the way it started, I think the genesis of the channel really uh, boded well for the positive group to be built up. Uh, the channel was, um, I, the first ever live stream that I did was the S and P inclusion day on Tesla. Oh, shit. Uh, 
Um, and that was like just when I was, my channel was eligible for the first time to even start live streaming. Cause I think you needed a thousand subs and I only started the channel like a, a week and a half before that or, or something like that. So mm. it was a really new channel and people were tossing ideas my way. Someone left a comment and said, Hey, why don't you do, why don't you live stream S and P inclusion day? And I was like, that's perfect. Like I'll, I'll, I'll live stream for power because back then Tesla stock. And right now we're probably in more of a, more of a valley of like news and like what's happening, because I think what's happening with uh, some of the geopolitical stuff trumps all the stuff that we're talking about. But yeah. back then it was like, everyone was thinking about Tesla. Everyone was watching Tesla stock. Like even if you were a investor, you wanted to tune in every hour probably to see what the stock ticker was. Cause it was just exponentially growing. There was a lot of news. And so like, I'd found myself, I I'd found myself um, really invested and uh, like just looking at Tesla news, looking in Tesla forums, going on Tesla Twitter, checking Tesla stock price to to almost a detriment to my productivity. And I was like, <laughs> man, I like really love doing this. And and obviously, like it doesn't matter what happens every hour in Tesla stock, but it's it's like something that for some reason I'm really attracted towards. Uh, trying to like figure out what's happening in the stock market, especially with Tesla back then. Why don't I share? I like, and I know for a fact there's a, a bunch of people out there that share the same sentiment as I do. And I had been watch, like I've been, tr tr you know, tr uh, I, I growing up, my, like my my dad is big on like day trading and like investing and like showing me the financial market. So growing up, I'd already had spoken a lot of the options lingo. Uh, me and my dad have been talking options since I was like probably seven years old. Oh man. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's a all, nerdy childhood. I love it. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's great. And it's, and it's definitely not for the better, by the way, if anyone, if anyone's like <laughs> eight years old, listen to this, you know, stay away from options. Um, Dad, I want to buy a call on Tesla, <laughs> <laughs> awesome. but it's, and I was, I was already like spending all this and investing all this time. So when I started the channel, yeah. it yeah. was, it was, it was a, a, an automatic, like easy, good vibes channel. And I think mm. that's what really attracted me to want to keep making videos. I almost mm -hmm. feel like if, if my, if my thing was, I have to come on and all I have to do is spread negativity, then I wouldn't be able to have the inner uh, work ethic to want to put out videos on a daily basis or put out, mm. because I, I think spreading positivity and it sounds corny is a lot easier on, uh, on like on you just selfishly speaking on your mental stress because you know at the end of the day what you're trying to do is really just better the world have fun you know it, life's not this serious right and i think people take life too seriously sometimes so uh it, it i have to give a, a big kudos to the community that that uh that has like really like made it like a self-fulfilling cycle of pro positivity and just like getting better and of course criticism is always welcome for me i always take criticism and try to up uh you know up my game there Mm -hmm. um, but that's not negative to me. That's just trying to be better. So, right. uh, yeah, it's been an awesome, uh, genesis of the channel. I think that is awesome. That's such a great story. And I, yeah, that the Juju gang shout out Juju gang. Um, they, th that's the one thing I noticed on our, on our live stream was like, just how like positive the the vibe was and the comments were so like nice and like very, mm -hmm. it, it just, it just, you can tell this, that the, the group is really, really honest and down to earth, you know? And like the one thing I've, I've started to think about too along those lines is like, because I've noticed like, especially with the geopolitical stuff that we're talking about, like how the, like the seems like right now we're, th there's a lot of bad stuff's happening with like the Russia Ukraine thing. But even before that, you think about how the media tries to focus on things that are not going well. It's constant, like not necessarily that the Russia Ukraine conflict is negative, but like there's mm -hmm. always this vibe of negativity around. And the one thing that dawned on me, I'm like, man, mm -hmm. like, if you really think about most things in the world, most things in the world either fail or t tend to go towards like the, like for example, a business, right? Yeah. What percentage of small businesses or businesses that get created succeed? It's like 20%, maybe yeah. less, right? Like it's hard for good things to happen in the world. And I feel mm. like mm. those people that focus on the good things happening or being positive about it is like, it's becoming less and less common because I think it's harder to do. Cause it's yeah. so easy. It's so easy to be like, you know, oh, this thing's going to fail. It's like, yeah, it, it probably is. <laughs> Statistics say that it's probably going to yeah. fail. Like, do you ever think about that? Like how, yeah. how rare it is? Like, I'm curious to hear your thoughts about that. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I, I, I think it's infinitely easier to, um, spread awareness, grow your channel, um, based on, uh, ways that I don't participate in, um, whether it be, you know, Criti heavy criticism or, you know, whatever it might be. I think it's, it's easier because at the end of the day, it has nothing to do with negativity. It has everything to do with, um, garnering your, uh, you know, attention and sharing, you know, yeah. what's, what's more shareable, 
like my live stream that I go through and we talk about Tesla for an hour or like someone's like 2020 expose on some, you know, back end scheme happening in, in X country or something like it's so yeah. much, it's, it's a lot more shareable, that type of content. And obviously that speaks to the human psychology and the human el uh, element, I think a, a large portion of it. But you know what? I've I've kind of I've kind of come to terms with with that a little bit to the degree where I, I kind of consider what I do um like almost selfishly for myself. So I don't really care for metrics. I don't really care for um watch time, view time. It is what it is. Obviously, mm. I want to up that. I don't want to you know uh, garner more value to the community, but I really care about growing an honest community of people that together, like I almost picture a lot of our community sitting down, hanging out, grabbing a drink, going to a coffee shop, and just talking. Like yeah. you know, at the end of the day, like that's the type of the, that's the type of community I want to garner. And, and and I think that the Juju Gang has done an awesome job with like cultivating that and like spreading positivity. Uh, yeah. But you're right, like negativity sells. It is what it is. Um, I, I don't let it in the beginning. I let it bother me a lot where I was like, Hmm, you know, like I'm getting 10 K views on this video. Whereas, you know, I could probably getting, you know, 50 K if all I did was make it a clickbait title. And yeah. then, you know, on then in the video, I started to roast something that I didn't disagree with. And by the yeah. way, everyone has their niche. I'm not, hit, I'm not hurting, but I'm not trying to hit on anyone by saying uh, right. this is bad or this is good. Just not yeah. my vibe, not my style, because that carries a lot of mental baggage for me to have to then uphold and carry and then face the criticism and then continually be in this splat of like back and forth action where it's, like, yeah. it's too much mental fatigue for me to have to carry with that kind of stuff. Like uh, I'd much rather just spare positivity. Um, and then what's that saying? Like everyone says, if you have nothing nice to say, don't say anything at all. Right. Uh, for the most part, that's kind of my motto uh, with that. Hell yeah. Yeah. That, I mean, that's, that's super admirable. And like the one thing that I'm finding with YouTube specifically ever since I started my channel is like, you talked about like, you know, you can tell which videos are doing better than others based on the subject matter. And then you, when you view it, like compared to other channels, if you were to compare them, you can see that, that negativity or roasting something definitely sells way better. And, and one of the things I, I caught myself doing like halfway, I've, I've had this channel for like what, three months, four months now. Yeah, um, you've killed it. I thank you. I mean, you, you have as well, but like my mine, mine's pure luck. It's like the dumbest luck in the world. And I'm just like, I'm just going to use it to like talk to really cool people. And I'm, I'm very happy with it, you know, but I don't think I it's think, luck. I don't think it's luck. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's years in the making that you probably don't give yourself uh, probably enough credit yeah. for, but uh, yeah, <laughs> perhaps. Well, I appreciate that. Yashu. Thank you very much. Yeah. I do think having that Tesla background definitely, that, that definitely helps. But yeah, the, the point I was making is like, I could see how those analytics can become like, they can really dictate what sort mm. of content you create because mm. I could see, I could really see, I started and, and to just to give you a little bit of background, my entire career before this thing has been in, in data. So I was a BI uh, director. So I literally had a team of analysts and all we did was look at data constantly. And I'm constantly thinking about what kind of data can I gather to make better decisions. And then once I started this YouTube thing, I'm like, holy shit, you can really get yourself into a really deep hole Absolutely. If you really like focus too much on those numbers and say, well, if I do a thumbnail like this, oh, like you know, surprise yes. face, yeah. like, you know, it, it could probably do so much better because you're playing to that. Like you said, that uh, part of that human condition is like, oh, my God, somebody looks surprised. And the title says, you know, everything's going down or recession, the recession is going to come tomorrow or whatever. Right. I'm like. But then I'm like, man, like, like, am I doing this for views or am I doing this for fun? Like, or am I doing this to bring value? Right? Like how, how hard is it for you to separate out the data from your everyday, like when you're yeah. creating content and, and you mm -hmm. kind of talked about it a little bit, you're like, you, you really do try and focus on the content first, but like how, how, how much does the data play into that? Or does it not play anything at all? Like, do you completely ignore it? I'm curious to see how you approach that. I mean, if any YouTuber tells you that they completely ignore their data, they're probably not very successful. So right. I definitely get that. Um, you know, one thing I learned early on just, uh, you know, in life and business, especially is that, you know, more is not, isn't always better. You know, I, I, you know, we were having this conversation with my business partner uh, about a year and a half ago, we we're talking about uh, a product launch and uh, mm -hmm. we we're talking about, would we rather have a thousand customers paying us, you know, 10 bucks, let's say, or, you know, just having 10 customers paying a thousand bucks each. And, you know, and of, of course, high ticket is where it's at high value is where it's at. So for me, I don't garner or I don't, I don't weigh 
um, unique views. I don't weigh views in general as much. Of course, I care about watch time because I, I want the content to be valuable. So people that do watch it like it. Um, but it, it's it's almost like I've taken the approach a little bit and 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 I and I humbly suggest that that you consider it is that building a community of the right people is a lot better than building a mass community of people. Like mm. if you were to go on to CNBC tomorrow as a as a as a as a guest. You'd probably get X thousand, uh, X thousand more views, X thousand more subscribers. Let's say, right? Let's say if you, if you became a regular monthly contributor. Mm-hmm. Well, those people don't necessarily know who Farzad is, what your story is, how you've come up. Uh, they don't. They haven't seen your stuff suggested in their YouTube algo, and then they're like, "Hey, this guy looks kind of cool." They just kind of saw you, and they're like, "Yeah, I'll give him a follow." Right? And so all of a sudden you're going to look at the metrics and you're going to, and you're going to think to yourself, wow, this is awesome. I've gained this many more subscribers, blah, blah, blah. But really, if you were to dig down into, and not to profile, but if you were to profile your audience, all of a sudden you would realize that X percentage of your audience and a growing amount of it don't even know who you are. Don't even care. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they're not really tuning in. You know, they, they just kind of followed you because they saw you on TV and that's what they do. Whenever someone comes on TV, you know, I'm just giving an example. So yeah, yeah. I, I think having, having the right people, um, having the right community is a lot important than having a massive community. Of course, um, as YouTube creators, we want to build both of those things all at once. They're not, they're not definitely not mutually exclusive. Yeah. Um, but it's, um, there's a really good essay, uh, called a thousand true fans. Right. And, uh, it talks, it, and it's, his name is Kelly something. I forget his name. Uh, I'm going to Google this after, but a mm. thousand true, and it kind of the S the kind of the essence of that essay hmm, weird is, is that <laughs> if, is that if you can build a core group of people that share the same ideologies as you share the same visions as you, the same passions, the same fears, then, I mean, it, it, yes, you can call them fans. I don't really call, I like calling people fans because it's just a community that we're building, but really that's what you need. It's kind of like having that coal to start the fire. And if you have that coal spread, spread across, you can't really blow that into a flame. You have to have it bunched up together and congruent. Mm. So YouTube metrics, definitely. I, well, if anyone, again, if anyone says they don't watch that, they, they don't look at it at all, they're probably lying. I look at my metrics what I care most about is is um, uh, probably like uh, like to dislike ratio to make sure that I'm on I'm on brand with kind of what I'm putting out, and then mm-hmm. like average view time um, in percentage because I like to see to what percent of of the from front to beginning do people want to watch. So and then comments of course that I always ask for like feedback. So yeah, got it. Okay, yeah, that's that that was a beautiful analogy. What was the name of the essay again? A uh, thousand true well, fans. A thousand. Tr- Let me write that down because. I got to read that. A thousand true fans. Kevin Kelly is the guy's name that wrote Kevin it. Kevin Kelly. Got this it. is like back in the, I think this is like 08, 09, like 2010 okay. type of, uh, yeah. It's it's like okay. an infamous, it's like an infamous essay blog on the inner web that someone posted an entrepreneur that like all entrepreneurs pass around in like the online sphere. Mm-hmm. Okay. Got it. Yeah. I'll definitely have to read that. And it, and it makes so much sense. And that's one thing that I'm noticing too with my with my channel is that there's a there's a core group of folks that are always watching the videos and I'm so freaking thankful for them because I'm like oh my god like this is like yeah. and they leave really nice comments and everything and then when I see that I'm like why am I why am I even paying attention to the analytics like like should I even open that freaking tab because it's like what mm-hmm. else what else more do I need than these like awesome people really appreciating the content and then probably going and telling their friends about it, you know, like, yeah. like why, why should I focus about anything else? Just focus on the content purely and, and forget the analytics. But I think to your point too, is like, if I want to be a good creator period, maybe I should pay attention. I got to make sure I'm not building crap, right? Like that's, that's one thing that I got to make sure that I'm not doing. So yeah. It's Sorry, hard. It's 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 yeah. hard. It's hard. It's hard to not want to gamify it. To, to yeah. and, and and as as a data person or as a business person, you're gonna want to optimize and continually yeah. push the buttons that are up and then that actually can be pushed. Yeah. Um. But I think it's important to realize that, like, at the end of the day, everyone's goals are different. Like, you may have a goal to build a really like-minded group of community of people and then ju- you just like putting out content whereas like it might be some other person or some other youtube creator's goal to maximize view to maximize ad revenue uh and yeah. not really care about engagement because all they care about is ad revenue fair enough like that's everyone has their own unique goal with this uh, yeah. i would ask yourself like what your terminal goal is with the channel like what would you in perpetuity want to grow and then 
optimize based on that, not optimize based on going on YouTube and finding out YouTube uh, ad secrets or like YouTube video secrets to like make your view, uh, make your videos viral and all this stuff. So right. I, I almost, I almost look at that as supplementary to, 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 to YouTube creators is that you build good content, but have fun doing it because you know, how many creators do you see post out content and then it's amazing. And then like for three months, they're just, they've like fell off and they just don't like doing it. And it's yeah. like, that sucks because you had awesome videos. I really was looking forward to it, but you were building something or, in a, and of course life stuff can come up, but you know, you're building something in a way that didn't motivate you to want to make more content. Yeah. Um, you know, that's the goal is like, is like how long you feel motivated to want to make content. And some days you're not going to f- feel motivated to make content. That's fine. Like, you know, you, yeah. you want to feel inspired. You want to feel up. And, and I think the community is so key because I have to give the community so much credit to me wanting to get up and make more content and put more stuff out and to talk and to, and to create a dialogue. If it wasn't for the community, it'd, it'd be hard to see how I'd want to keep this up um, to the degree that I have. Yeah, that's, that's, I agree with that a hundred percent. And honestly, I think the, the, the community is, is really the reason why I feel that way as well. Like, honestly, like, and, and the thing too, is, is the, the balancing act between wanting to do this, uh, as much as I, as, as much as I can, because I really enjoy it, but then also preventing burnout is something that I'm Mm -hmm. trying really hard to balance. And I'm curious to pick your brain on this too, because what, what I, the kind of personality I have is that if I really enjoy doing something, I'll do it until I collapse, you mm-hmm. know, like that's kind of like my personality and it's yeah. enabled me to do really great things in the past, you know, for me. And I've learned a lot and I've built a lot of resilience and I'm able to make things happen in a certain way. But at the same time, I, I also, my, my relationships can suffer and then my personal health can suffer. So like with this, I'm trying really hard to to really create that balance, but it doesn't come naturally for me. How, and, and I noticed on your, on your live streams too, on the, on the Friday, when we, when we did ours, you said, you know, yeah. everybody like get off your phones, you know, like for the weekend, like try to like enjoy life, be present. How is that natural for you? Is that something you had to learn? I'm curious to hear. Mm. I, I partly say it for, again, selfish reason, because I, I want to remind myself it, um, all the mm. time. Cause I, for me, I have a hard time being present for sure. In terms of burnout, creating content, first thing I would say um, is that if you can build a system where you don't have to do much, uh, it's always easier to create content. Like I think, uh, like for example, me, Kevin has talked about this in a past video. You know, he just wants to go in the office, record and leave. He doesn't want to have to do too much messing around with keyword research, editing, like all this stuff is like supplementary to the process of him as a creator. And so Mm. I've really taken that approach as well of when I sit down, yes, I'll make the thumbnail, which will take me like, like two or three minutes and I'll have a system down for that. I'll have the title ready prior to when I record, but I'm not editing. Like if all my mm-hmm. videos are one take, um, probably you can find maybe like two videos, maybe in the beginning of my channel that I, that, that I was really editing for. Mm-hmm. I like to do one takes, one takes only, um, and then just publish them like right there. And then after I record them, like often when you see like I've uploaded a video, it, I, I just recorded it probably in the last like 20 minutes before I, I hit publish. So mm-hmm. Ha- but but what that allows me to do is avoid stuff like all the mental fatigue of like, oh, I have all the clips for this. I got to put them together. And of course, you can't create a Netflix type video doing my strategy, right? Everyone has their own strategy. Uh, but if but what it does for me is it allows me to all day marinate in something like have an idea for a video for today or look at the markets, what's happening. And then when it comes like market close or when it comes time that I'm actually ready, yeah. It's just, I sit down, I put up what I need, I record, I publish it and I'm out. And then that way I feel like not only do I do the audience a service there by pu- pu- publishing like timely content, like stuff that I just have reported. So if you're looking for like my honest feedback to what's happened to today's market, for example, like that makes sense. But then yeah. for me, it allows me to every day want to sit down and actually do it. And it doesn't take me more than like, let's say 45 minutes, 30 mm. minutes. Right. And so I think burnout is real there. In terms of being present, I think that's a big problem that I have. And that's why I often say it on the Friday streams, it's like put tech away, go hang out mm-hmm. with family, go to the park, get a hike, because we're so glued to technology uh, today. And I mean, rightfully so, we have everything that we ever have needed on it, um, you know, from our money to our friends, to our, uh, you know, uh, to st- obviously stocks. Uh, so anything yeah. that we need is like in our fingertips. 
but that's almost like a detriment to productivity today. And, and of course, I'm, I personally have had a hard time dealing with it. Uh, yeah. So on, on the Fridays, I like to say that just as a reminder, throw it out there because you never know if someone like that really hits home for them and they've really been meaning to do it. But just having someone tell it to them is yep. like, is like very different, right? If someone tells, if the doctor tells you to do something or your wife does, you're probably going to listen to the doctor first, even though you probably should. <laughs> to your wife. It's, it's just you know, having that uh, extra person in your life just to remind you, I think. Yeah, that's a, that's. I could tell you that that when you said that that hit home with me because it's being present it has been a challenge for me for as long as I can remember and that's something my wife constantly like reminds me of like she mm. she really is trying to get me to a like position where every morning I can you know I meditate and I really get off like don't even look at your phone when you first wake up take the first hour hour and a half and mm. just wake up stretch you know kiss the wife get up you know use the restroom and then you know meditate stretch have a cup of coffee, chat, you know, maybe read a book or something mm -hmm. and then get on your devices and then check and see what's going on. But I find that to be, mm -hmm. I've just been conditioned a certain way for so long. I conditioned my, myself. This is hundred percent my fault where, you know, it's like I get up and I'm like, Oh, email, what's going on? What did yeah. I miss? You know? Oh my God, Twitter. Oh, what's going on right now? And I really need to know what's going on right now. Cause I, I want to know what's going on. And then, then yeah. you know, when I really sit down and I think about it, even as a content creator, I'm like, but who cares? Like, wh why can't I wait an hour? Like, why why does it have to be immediately? Will an hour really kill me mm -hmm. to try and get myself present and try to set a good pace for the day? Right. Um, it, I mean, it resonates with me when you say that because I need that. <laughs> yeah. I need I need that uh, sort of mentality shift uh, for myself. And, I, and I'm trying to go towards it. And I, I spoke to um, Stephen Mark Ryan, which I'm 100% sure you know, but... Uh, he, um, I talked to him about that and, and his approach is very unique because he's like, yeah, I don't even like, I, I have all notifications off and basically I, I just, I go to the device when I need to, otherwise I'm just enjoying life and I'm being present. I'm like, you son of a, like that <laughs> sounds incredible. And, and I want that, but I think it's just practice. I think at that point it's just practicing and sticking with it. And yeah. that's what I got to work towards, you know, practicing and having workflows that, that allow you to do that. Right. If, that's true. if, uh, if like everything's tied to your, like for me, a big, a big, uh, not time suck, but like a big attention seeker for me is like my, our, our community's discord. I'm always mm. wanting to be in there. I want to see what's happening, what's the community saying, what's happening with the stock price. Like it's, it's my go-to, um, mm. not like more, even more so than Twitter, but it's mm. like, I have to sometimes like I'm doing the same thing now where in the morning when I wake up, I'm staying away from it for, for the first little bit being present and then coming to it when I come back home from a walk or, or a drive or something like that. So mm. yeah, it's a problem for everyone. Yeah. How long have you been doing YouTube? Uh, started uh, December of tw uh, 2020. So it's been a year and three months. Okay. And then um, what were you doing before that? Uh, I was working, uh, we had, me and my business partner, we had our own business uh, in real mm -hmm. estate marketing. Uh, I'm also a realtor. So uh, oh, nice. obviously, yeah, doing that stuff as well. So doing my own business, the, the channel kind of started, by the way, just like it, it started... Um, like during that time, our business, was, we were kind of like winding it down to a degree where we were like, okay, like we want to pivot, but I wasn't, I, you know, I kind of wanted to take a sabbatical as well. And like mm. everything kind of came together where I was like, you know what, like the, the amount of time that I'm saving off spending time in the business, I'm like wanting to do more creative stuff for like mm. what seems like the first time in my life. Cause I'm not very creative, not very artsy. Like that's not my vibe. I'm more of like a, like a math guy. Right. And mm. so, um, coming, uh, coming out of the business a little bit towards the end of 2020, beginning of 2021, um, I, I started finding myself uh, doing more content and then that channel, the channel kind of filled the void a little bit in my life of just like a passion that turned into something bigger than I ever had, have like would have thought it, it would have turned into. And I mm -hmm. think the story is similar to yours, right. A little bit, uh, where the passion just kind of turned into this thing and then you just kind of have this thing that you're like, Whoa, okay. Like I can, I can like make this, uh, something that I do consistently. So, uh, yeah, the past, the, before that though, business, um, re, we had a real estate marketing platform, real estate marketing course, um, mm. teaching realtors how to do leads and all that sort of stuff. So come from the business world, um, entrepreneur at heart. So seeing myself make content is kind of odd because I never would have thought I would have been a content creator, but, yeah. uh, but, uh, I'm happy where I am and, and, uh, yeah. That was going to be one of my questions was like, did you like say two, three years ago, like say a year before you started your channel, did you even see yourself? doing this, you know, was that even part of the plan? 
You know, what's funny. I, for anyone listening, uh, will find this actually hilarious. Four years ago, uh, 2015 or 2016, I found my, I found on my old, on my personal YouTube channel that mm. all these videos are private. So you can't find them. I, mm. I, I remember that for a summer uh, I was day trading back then. So I was like wanting to stream and stuff like that. I'd found like four or five live streams that I had done but I didn't know how to set up the technology. And it was just me watching CNBC uh, uh, day trading options in the summer between like university. And like, I, I, I saw that like two or three months ago, I went through, I was going through my YouTube, my old, my, like my, my Gmail YouTube. And I was like, mm-hmm. what, what are these, vi- what are these like, f- like one and a half hours videos that, Oh, Oh yeah. I forgot that. I like, I had tried to use OBS to know how to work it. Like there was no one, like it was like one view is probably like me. Right. And it's mm-hmm. like, and it's, it's, it, it was hilarious to go back and like, go through and see myself doing this because I was like, it's so funny. Cause that's kind of what I do now. Uh, yeah. albeit, albeit that I'm not trading live or something, but you know, I, that's kind of what I do now, but I had been doing it like seven years ago with no one watching and no one really cared. And then now I've kind of found a niche that a uh, good community of people and I kind of do the same thing. So <laughs> it's kind of, yeah, funny that's funny. Are you ever going to release those uh, old videos? You think? <laughs> I don't think it's worth it because I, 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 I think I say like one sentence every like five minutes and it's like, Oh, I'm going in the, I'm going into this trade. I'm going, it's like, it's like the most boring stuff ever that you could probably ever imagine. You're just so focused on the, on the, on what's going on that you're going to like, who yeah. knows, who knows? Yeah, different that's times. funny. <laughs> Juju gang, let us know in the comments. Do you want to see the old content? Maybe we'll put some pressure on you. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I may have find a clip. I'm clip. just kidding. Oh my God. That's so funny. Yeah. I, I, do you think, so what's interesting for me is like, if I, if I think about my sort of journey into YouTube, like. For me, one of the biggest catalysts was COVID. So like COVID mm. happening was really the thing that set into motion my journey. Cause I was, mm. I had been a Tesla and then COVID happened. And then during COVID was that gigantic stock, you know, I mean, the stock was 900 freaking or whatever it was plummeted down and then it V-shaped to freaking crazy levels. Right. And then at that time I'm like, okay, so, you know, my, I saw my dad get super sick from COVID to the point where I thought he was going to pass away, but thankfully he's made a full recovery. So I saw that happen. Oh, wow. And then I saw like how everybody like, you know, was like wondering if the world was going to end and I'm sitting there and I'm like asking myself, I'm like, okay, so like I'm seeing all these things happening around me and mm-hmm. I love working at Tesla and, but like, do, is this really like, what, what's, what's the point here? Like, what's my, what's my journey? You know? So it's almost like, like, I don't know if this period for me is a sabbatical of sorts, because like one of the things I'm coming to realize is like, because mm-hmm. um, w- when, when I first made the decision to leave and like start this, I started the journey without having any idea where it was going to take me. All I knew was that I needed to take a journey. Like I needed to step away. I was grinding for so freaking long yeah. and now I need to step away and sort of pursue what my actual purpose is in life, you know? Mm-hmm. And the YouTube thing kind of appeared out of nowhere and, and I'm doing it because I enjoy it. But like the thing that really like sticks out to me is like COVID was really like if and COVID was an awful thing and still is an awful thing. And it's so many people have suffered. But like I feel like if COVID didn't happen, like I'm not really sure I would be where I am right now, you know, especially like moving to Austin and Hmm. sort of making the moves that we've done. How do you think COVID has impacted your like journey? Like has it had any negative impacts, positive impacts, neutral impacts? I'm curious to hear. Hmm. Yeah. COVID is of course like a terrible thing. Um, uh, but yeah, for a lot of people, it's been a blessing in disguise. I think what COVID has done, uh, just macro speaking is kind of shifted society to be more accepting of online and to f- come to grips with like the zoom call. Like, I feel like it's probably wouldn't even been normalized a year ago, uh, often to like, want to do sit down interviews, like, you know, Joe Rogan style, you want to come in, into the booth. Right. Uh, COVID has done, uh, has done, um, has shifted mindsets as well in the workspace where people are like workers are kind of asking themselves the same question that you were saying existentially, like, why am I, why am I grinding so hard? What's the point? Do I even like what I'm doing? And it's been a forcing mechanism and will continue to be, cause we're only barely out of it and, and will continue to be for workers still at that same job asking themselves, like, look, like I, I make X amount of money per year. I spent all of my waking time at a job nine to five. Um, you know, what am I really doing here? Right. Like existential. And I think moments like that, of course, um, are forcing uh, mechanisms and forcing changes for a lot of people. 
Yeah. Uh, for me, I think COVID has kind of had the sim- had a similar effect to that a little bit where, you know, COVID was great for our business, uh, you know, not like, not because we're working healthcare or anything like that, but, you know, working from home, realtors were looking for more marketing, more, uh, more advice, more content, more everything around that mm. because they needed to switch their business to be more online based. And that mm. was what we specialized in before COVID. So, mm. Um, of course that helped their business, but towards the end of the year, as I kind of wrapped the, as you kind of, uh, uh, wrapped the business up and I kind of, uh, wanted to like do something different. It was the same reason it was, you know, like in the last eight months, I haven't done anything. I haven't left my house. Um, where's like, where's the community? Like where are, of course I have friends, but you know, that's, you can't travel. Like it's not the same thing. You can't go out and like go to meetups, go to entrepreneur meetups or, or to, you know, meet up with a group of people that you've never met with at a networking event. Like you didn't have that. And so maybe there was a yearning there for me as well of having a community because I was already spending, like I said, all this time watching Tesla, watching Tesla news, watching all the YouTube channels. And so Maybe it was that calling of like, I want to build my own community because I know no one's really talking about the stuff in Tesla sphere that I like to talk about. Uh, options, the markets, macro, how everything affects uh, <laughs> pertinent to back to Tesla. And yeah. so I think having that void uh, allowed me to want to create more content around that. So perhaps COVID did accelerate it. Yeah. Um, albeit, got it. Albeit bad ways, but yeah, for sure. Yeah. Got it. Okay. And then when, when did you get into Tesla? Like what was, what was the thing that, that really got you interested? Yeah. So Tesla, it's, it's a funny story. So definitely not, uh, 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 have not been in Tesla as, as long as like someone like you have, uh, like you have over 10 years, you were saying, right. Mm-hmm. Um, my dad actually got me into Tesla. So okay. funny story, like my, my dad is usually the other way around. It's the kid getting the I know, dad into Tesla. Yeah. <laughs> Everyone laughs at that story. It's, it's funny. Like shout out to my dad. He's such a hype beast. Uh, it's true and true. Like he's like, he's like, he's like the most old school hype beast ever. Like he, anything is new, hot, flashy investment speaking wise, or just like life wise. He's, he's kind of there. That's so um, sick. It's, um, it's hilarious. So my dad actually for like background for me, I never got the business model of Tesla originally, like let's say prior to model three ramp. I Mm. always thought I kind of, I kind of fell into the FUD a lot of the time. I just glance at CNBC every now and then watch every headline. Uh, I love tech. I'm a tech guy. I've, you know, I've been an Apple fanboy for a long time. Mm -hmm. So Tesla, you would think makes total sense. Like apples to apples, you would get Tesla. But, you know, I, I'm not afraid to admit, like, I, I I didn't get Tesla originally, especially like the financial model. I was like, how is this going to work? How are they going to scale? Their balance sheet doesn't look very strong. You know, all the FUD talking points. And so yeah. um, my dad actually uh, got me to test drive with him a Model 3. And that's when everything changed. So mm. early on, when the Model 3 came and, and people were doing test drives, my dad said, look, like, I'm really considering getting one. I, I want the whole family to come, me and my sister and my mom to go test drive this car, see how it is. I'm like, okay, I'll fine. I'll come with you guys. So it came, he drove first, my sister after I was like, okay, good, nice car, whatever. And so my dad's like, no, you got to drive too. I'm like, no, I'm not, I don't, I've, I've, I've sat in the back, whatever. My dad's like, no, you got to drive. Like you forced my hand into this. And so I was okay. like, fine, I'll go around the block. As soon as I sat into the driver's seat, adjusted everything, had uh, the screen right in front of me, everything changed. Not financially speaking, because of course I had to go through my, uh, my due diligence that way and like right. try to convince myself, but it changed because I was like, I kind of had like that, that coming of, of, of truth moment. Like when you open your iPhone box for the first time that you, you know, and Apple's created that amazing experience. I had kind of had that moment where I was like, Oh, like all of a sudden as a tech fan, I I was like, okay, I get it. I understand what's happening here a little bit. And so sitting in the product for me was the catalyst and sitting down, driving it, the acceleration, uh, I had driven electric before, but nothing like a Tesla. And mm. going through uh, the UI, going through, uh, 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 I think the sales rep showed us the app and how it worked and how charging worked. It got mm. me thinking a lot more about it day to day. And so all that did was just to turn me a little bit green on thinking about, okay, what's actually happening here? And am I missing like what might be the biggest revolution um, to come? And as a, as a, as, and I, I freely admit this all the time. I always say, you know, if you ever want to know if something's going to go popular, 
ask my opinion. If I'm against it originally, it's probably going to hit. I have a very bad track record with things originally. Like it takes me a second to kind of jump on the things and that's fine. I just, uh, that's just who I am for now. And so mm-hmm. like, for example, like AirPods didn't understand them. Now I own like three pairs. Like I love AirPods, Snapchat, same thing. I remember in high school, Snapchat was getting paid. I was like, when you just use that WhatsApp, like send mm-hmm. photos. So like, mm-hmm. I have this track record that, that, that I like to, I, I like to just really <laughs> talk about whatever. And so as soon as I had that kind of flip of the switch, and I started looking at more of the financials, looking at someone like Kathy Wood. My dad kept sending me videos about Kathy Wood. <laughs> it's hilarious. Dude. And so he kept sending me videos about Kathy Wood. And I was like, this chick is crazy. Like, what are you talking <laughs> about? And so eventually I was like, hold on. She she might have a point. And so I started digging in, digging more in, started watching more YouTube content. Awesome YouTubers out there uh, if, uh, talking Tesla, of course. Yep. It kind of got me like, I was like, I'm on the wrong side of history a little bit. And Mm. I'm fine with being like that, but I'm not fine with staying like that. I think it's okay Mm. to be wrong, but it's not okay to continue to stay wrong in the face of evidence. And so Mm. as I kind of had this flip of the switch, um, let's say Shanghai ramp around the Shanghai time. uh, And then of course, Tesla almost did a thousand dollars pre-split back then. And then, you know, Mm. came back crashing down uh, during COVID times. That's really when everything kind of changed for me that I was like, okay, like this is Tesla, like this is what Tesla's story is going to be like. This is why Mm. their growth is going to stick. uh, And this is why no one else is going to win. And of Mm. course, uh, being able to research electric vehicles on the ground, like I knew what the Bolt was. I knew what the Nissan Leaf was. I knew what the Kona was. I knew what the wait times were. I knew what the, I knew what, uh, what like battery pack size each one of them had. Uh, mm-hmm. I knew the, I knew the degradation levels, like which ones had way, uh, you know, way better degradation than the others. And so coming from kind of like grassroots level a little bit to like researching cars uh, for the family to then switching into like Tesla investing. I think, of course, like I would have loved it if I just had been in Tesla for the last 10 years. And like, I love investing. I love trading. That's kind of my background. It's ironic that I wasn't, Mm -hmm. but it's like, I'm I'm glad to have come through it in the way that I've come through fundamentally speaking, at least with like boots on the ground and like trying the product. Because I think for me, that's a much more of a stronger moat to my thesis rather than just looking at the balance sheet, because that's just like, uh, it's like putting it into plain terms and it's kind of uh, d- dummying down what a lot of Tesla is really about. So yeah, no, that's a great story, and, and thanks for for your candid uh, s- storytelling there. Because I think, like, I, if I draw a parallel to what how I got into Tesla and invested into it, it was at, not at all like driven by financials or numbers or anything. It was mm-hmm. like purely like at the very beginning it was like elon looks like a super honest guy who appears to know what he's talking about the car looks dope and it's getting really good reviews and its mission is very very important screw it i'm gonna throw some money in there and then when i started seeing it gain a lot of track and i was honestly i was so lucky to get in before that initial ramp up in 2013 when it went from like 30 bucks this is pre-split 30 dollars to like 180 I was so lucky to be in the stock at that time because I don't, if I wasn't in there at that time, mm. I'm not sure I would have had the patience to really mm. watch it like do the do nothing. nothing for like five years or six years, however yeah. long it was. So like it's it's very interesting hearing your side of the thesis because I do think yours your the way you've approached it is so much more sound and way more logical in a sense because you're actually you have the product knowledge you've test drove the car then you did a bunch of diligence to really figure out the numbers and the financials and then you said yep this makes total sense and its growth trajectory is is looking great so i'm gonna i'm gonna decide to invest in it or or whatever you decided to do so do you think like based on that where you were you know before once you started investing in where you are now is this an expected like did you expect this sort of price movement to happen? And like, how do you think about its future price movement? Like where, where is it in relation to where you thought it was going to be at this time back when you first invested? Yeah. I mean, looking at like, what is it today? Tesla is, let's say 800 bucks or something like that. I forget. 788. Uh, what, 788. Right now. Let's round up. Let's say it's 800. So pre-split that's what, $4,000. Mm-hmm. I mean, what we, we only split like, so like so long ago. Right. So mm-hmm. uh, never in my experience of the capital markets, have I seen a company turn from as small as Tesla has market cap wise to a mega cap, a legit mega cap company. Mm-hmm. And, and, and 
been stress tested as much as Tesla has. I mean, that's debatable, but I think it has considering the macro situations that we're going through. I agree. Um, uh, it, it, no, there's no way that, you know, if you asked me, let's say even during uh, the summer of 2020, a couple months into Corona, uh, into Corona crash, no way. I mean, come on, if anyone's being uh, intellectually honest back then, we would have taken, you know, X thousands of dollars, two, three, maybe. Right. So yeah. $4,000. And this is the crash level of, as we talk here in 2022 that yeah. we're talking about. Right. So, I mean, who knows, who knows really where it goes from here? Of course, the fed is going to raise rates. I think everyone and their mom knows that and everyone and their mom is talking about it. That's fine. Um, the Ukraine crisis, you know, some news out with perhaps peace talks there, but it just seems like showboating for now. Yeah. Um, so, you know, who knows where the capital markets go? Um, I think Tesla has a really strong future, though, f- fundamentally speaking. Berlin, Austin, going to add capacity, going to switch over the 4680 battery cell packs, increase margin, increase range, increase efficiency, lower weight. Um, so it's hard to see, of course, Tesla stock has not performed well in 2022. That's fine. But it's hard to see how that correlates at all with the business that Tesla is running. And of course, those are the times where you might seek to have alpha. Um, and I think in two years when Berlin, Austin are fully ramped and Fremont has, has shifted towards whatever they need to in terms of 4680s. And Shanghai is just doing Shanghai things, awesome stuff going on there. But as we talk, of course, there's the coronavirus fears of, of lockdown in the city. Um, but you know, in two years from now, it's just hard to see how Tesla isn't still selling every car they can make. We've seen demand skyrocket up 100% in some states uh, mm-hmm. after gas price increases. So fundamentally speaking, anecdotally speaking, even in my network, and of course, plural of anecdote is not data, but Plural, uh, but anecdotally, like everyone's asking about EVs now. Everyone, like even people that I know have like four pickup trucks, are like, "Oh, so when's that like Ford F one fifty Lightning coming out? When's that Cybertruck coming mm-hmm. out? How are they different?" And so it's like even those people are now considering, "Okay, hold on, maybe I should switch electric." And I think that's super important, not only for the world, but, but of course, but uh, but especially for Tesla, because other than Tesla, there is no mass producer of electric vehicles nor will there be in the next two or three years at least. So yeah. it's hard to say how anyone competes, but Tesla's Tesla's going to be just fine fundamentally. Yeah. Yeah. I, I agree hundred percent there. I think, I think the one thing that I, I don't see being talked about at all in, in, in the news media, it's directly related to Tesla and sort of EVs is, but like, I know that Tesla community has brought this up many times and there's a lot of uh, studies that have been done around the, within the community, but this um, ICE, ICE cliff, that we're potentially going to go into here in the next, what it looks like in the next couple of quarters, just based on what's going on with the chip shortage and how yeah. the conversation is really shifting to EVs, where you're going to have a, a period in time for the next, say, three to five years, while yeah. EVs get ramped up, demand for ICE vehicles should go off a cliff because people are going to wait to buy their EVs instead of buying something that's going to depreciate in value and become obsolete. Like, yeah. do you buy into that? Have you thought about that? Are yes. you doing anything from a market perspective to play that? Walk me through it. Yeah, I have a hard time shorting or or synthetically, I guess, by buying puts Ford or GM. I know a lot of Tesla bulls will. I have a yeah. hard time um, buying puts uh, in those kind of companies because I think uh, you run the risk of of governmental support and like the mm. invisible hand a little bit of of mm. propping these companies up, and that's fine. Whatever. There's a lot of pension tied to these companies, so I think the government and unions are are scared of that. Fair enough. Yeah. yeah. I, I, so it's funny because even though I think yes, I agree. Like GM, how are they going to all of a sudden like switch to like they talk about the Altium battery and you know all this stuff, but it's hard to see where they're going to get the, where they're going to get the raw supplies from, and then how are they going to convert the raw supplies using human capital that they that they don't have at the moment uh, with battery tech and switch into like the, everyone thinks ICE cars and EV cars are the same factory and you just switch a couple of things. They couldn't be yeah. more different. Right. Yeah. Um, so uh, I think uh, uh, internal combustion engines will pro- will definitely hit a cliff soon enough. And I think we're seeing it a little bit. Ford has just guided down uh, to uh, from 2 million cars in 2022 to 1.66 million cars in 2022 is what they're guiding for due to chip shortage. Now, listen, like you can buy into that story or you could buy into waning demand as being one and chips just being an excuse. If a, if a, if a company like Tesla is still growing 50% year over year, aiming to, let's say, I guess we'll find out by the end of this year. Uh, and Ford is downgrading from two to 1.5. Like the argument used to be 
well, look, Ford is making millions of cars. GM's, uh, GM is making millions of cars. Of course, they're going to be more disproportionately affected by shortages than Tesla, who's a young and coming, you know, up and coming automaker, you know, only making a couple hundred thousand, right? Like, of course. Okay, but now Tesla made 936,000 cars last year, aiming for 1.5 this year. Like, those are not baby numbers anymore. Um, yeah. So it's hard to see what legacy is saying as nothing but an excuse for demand for, for demand waning. And I'm seeing it locally or at least again, uh, anecdotally. Yeah. So yes, I think it's definitely happening. And how do I play it market wise? I have a hard time, like I said, betting against them market yeah. cap wise, not fundamentally wise, but just like stock wise in the short haul, because anything can happen with the administration to prop, uh, prop up these companies. Because again, a lot of pension is tied and retirement rightfully so is, is tied to these companies. So it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be like, um, you know, X, Y, Z small business going under, it would be a really big deal. Ford and GM now, uh, had bigger problems than they didn't know it. Yeah. I, I agree 100% with, with your approach, but I think the one thing you hit on with like the, 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 the excuse using the chip shortage potentially as an excuse and using the parallels of like Tesla being smaller before versus right. now where they're making million plus cars a year. Then you also look at Lucid and Rivian who have also slashed their, yeah. their guidance and they are s- small potatoes compared to Tesla and yeah. they're citing chip shortage as, as, a, as a waning, like the reason why. But like, again, to me, what that tells me and again, I'm trying not to be cynical and I'm trying not to be like negative on these companies, but I, I've i been exposed to corporate America. I've been exposed to companies that are not like Tesla and using any excuse you can that the broader market will buy as something that says, hey, this is what's actually happening is an all too common strategy that these companies yeah. do. So that's where my head goes to immediately when Ford and GM and Rivian and Lucid cite chip shortages or supply, issues, supply chain issues for cutting their guidance to me is like 100% has nothing to do with that. Maybe 10 to 20% of that demand could be that. But the other 80%, it's either you're having staffing issues, you're having demand issues, you're having uh, ramp issues that are self-inflicted, supply issues, supply chain issues that are Mm self-inflicted. It has nothing to do with it. And And then the other side of it too is like Ford GM and all these other companies, theoretically, them being as big as they are, they should have first dibs when it comes to these chips. You know, like they should have like the yeah. the sort of a, a lever they can pull or have leverage to say, dude, like we'll buy we'll buy five million chips, like legit, we'll buy five million chips, and then you can sell it to whoever you want. We'll even pay a premium for those, which should leave like the smaller companies, like a like a Raven or a Lucent or a Tesla, without as many chips. So like that mm-hmm. demand should have hurt them a lot more disproportionately. Yeah. But you can also make an argument maybe Tesla is just way better at negotiating. Uh, and, and stabilizing their supply chain because why wouldn't be because they're better at everything else that in the in <laughs> auto market so you can make an argument for that but I'm right there with you man and I'm and I'm getting really concerned I talked to my um we just made a new friend uh my wife met a new friend uh, a few months ago and, and I and I got to uh, meet her husband he's he's awesome I, I really like him but he worked at GM for seven years and he stopped mm. working there in 2020 he was uh in IT um, and he did a lot of that work but like speaking with him, and this is sort of a segue, but like it kind of points to this sort of uh, uh, potential cliff that we're getting at. Like the one thing that I got from him from an insider's perspective was that the rate of progress of those companies appears to be extremely slow. And that, yeah. that was from his own sort of uh, how he gets, because I was really picking his brain. And I'm really, I want to I wanna bring him on the channel one day to just to talk to him about the dynamic, but I'm like trying, I also want to be respectful of, I don't want him to like, you know, talk shit on his previous employer or whatever. So, right. um, but it was very interesting what, what he was talking about. Like all the things that we talk about, oh, these legacy automakers are slow, that they're not going to be able to innovate. I was mm-hmm. able to talk to somebody who was directly responsible for developing uh, software tools and I and IT tools and was exposed to a bunch of different parts of the company. He himself was saying like, "Hey, like they're super slow. Like they do they do <laughs> one software one software release a quarter, you know, yeah. at, at GM apparently. And Tesla, oh my, oh my god, we had a software release every freaking day. You know, sometimes <laughs> like sometimes we had it every day. It was at most uh, at least once a week. But like that kind of jives with what I'm seeing now. Like. Like if, if folks are hoping that Ford, or especially GM in this case, have some sort of like hidden 
sort of like thing that could potentially get him get him out of this uh, potential cliff that they're heading towards and then that the reasoning behind their them mm-hmm. slashing their rates is truly chip shortages and supply chain i'm not really sure that's the case i think it's just a matter of it's innovators dilemma i don't know if you ever read the book but it's like listen like sometimes you're too big and then you get disrupted and you can't uh yeah. you can't really sh- shift over fast enough cuz you're just too bulky and heavy and you just Mm-hmm. You you fail, you know. Mm-hmm. So I don't know, man. I'm just getting really worried about that because it is going to impact a lot of jobs. It's going to decimate Detroit completely, and I don't know, man. I, I think that might ultimately be the reason that we get into a recession. And I want to talk to you about the recession mm-hmm. too. But like my head mm-hmm. tells me, is like the recession is really going to be triggered by the all these um, legacy automakers failing, and mm-hmm. a bunch of people are going to get laid off, mm-hmm. and supply chains are going to get massively disrupted. And you're not going to have the backstop from the EV side to really cover that demand. And you're going to have a total, you're going to have a, a, a re- true recession in the economy because you have an entire mm. industry collapsing onto itself. Mm. I'm curious to hear your thoughts about recession. Like, do you think it's going to happen? And how do you think this is going to play into it? Yeah. yeah. By the way, gr- like, great point, by the way, just harping on, on one aspect there. Like, just think yeah. about it this way. Like, legacy's dilemma can be summed up just blankly like this. Let's say Ford was aiming to do 2 million cars this year. If all of a sudden they find themselves selling 2.7, let's say, what is the sales and management team telling themselves at the end of this year when they sell 2.7? They're saying, awesome, we're selling great, continue to do what we're doing, make more cars. Okay, so you're not selling more EVs then. You're not switching to to EVs then. All right, let's say the opposite happens. They sell 1.2 this year and they're aiming to do 1.7 now. Okay, this isn't working. We're running out of money. We need to print more. How do we print more? Do the thing that we know how to do best. Make stay true to our fundamentals. Stay true to our core competency. Make more internal combustion engine vehicles. So yep. either way, legacy has to cut off their own hand to eat it for breakfast. Like it's no easy way out. You have to pivot, uh, and it's just hard to see how they're going to pivot and how they're going to want to commit to that pivot, other than just putting out platitudes. So yeah. Um, in terms of recession, yeah, of course, like Michigan, uh, even Michigan law, right? Like, I don't think in Michigan, you can order a Tesla and get it uh, delivered, right? Like you have to go out of state. Like there's so many, uh, and I think Texas is the same way, is it not? Yeah, I think you have to go, I think Tesla has to like ship their cars out of state and then they have to ship it back in through, I don't know, it's some weird convoluted thing. I'm sure it'll change. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sure it'll change. Yeah. Like it's going to look really silly for the governor to like. (laughs) tout this amazing gigafactory and yes, then be like oh yeah. by the way you can't buy it like you can't buy their product that they're shipped they have to ship it out of state and then bring it back in like there's no yeah. it's going to change they, they yeah. have way too many jobs and too much it's yeah anyway it's political Absolutely. it's a political suicide for you know? sure yeah. uh, but, but uh back to your point about uh talking about recession now yeah um so what so what is a recession i think first is important to highlight two negative quarters of GDP growth consecutively. That's the definition of a recession, of course. And so off the bat, you might think that's not that bad. And to be honest, like, of course, no one wants to see a recession happen, but they're a normal part of the market economic cycle. Um, What do recessions really do? They allow capital to be reallocated from companies that it's not serving well. It allows labor to be freed up in ventures that might not be, you know, free market theory, by the way. So, you know, trigger warning there, but if, if, you, know, <laughs> you know, you know, it, it frees up labor in like projects that like really don't serve anyone. It, mm. it, it, it pops bubbles, let's say, uh, for companies that have never been earning any money and never plan to do so. So recessions are a healthy, I mean, it's, it's not healthy because we know what recessions can do to the average household and no one wants to see that happen, but at a unit, at a macroeconomic level, you know, they're part of the cycle. Now, the, the the real fear with the recession is this is inflation is at, at all, like 40 years highs so you know we're talking seven eight percent I think seven point eight percent was was the last print year over year mm-hmm. um recessions at all t- or, or inflations at all-time highs and to be honest the economy is not that strong I think the latest Atlanta Fed GDP now estimate for quarter uh for quarter four growth or quarter one growth is like 0.5 or something like that. It had been negative uh throughout uh January and February two estimates were. So if all of a sudden you find yourself in a way where in- inflation's at seven or eight percent and you're the Fed, the only uh the only monetary policy you have to combat inflation is to increase the Fed fund rate, to increase uh, interest rates. And now if you increase interest rates, yes, you'll fight inflation because there'll be less borrowing, less spending. 
But what does that do? If we know increasing rates uh, reduces uh, the demand on the economy, uh, less people go out, less people want to eat, less people want to buy random stuff, less jobs, so on and so forth. So mm-hmm. the combating of inflation comes at the expense of cutting back on the economy a little bit. Now, all of a sudden, mm-hmm. you get yourself into a point where you see inflation at, at like 40 year highs, but you see the GDP estimates not high at all. Now you're at, okay, we have to increase rates because inflation is just a beast that, you know, it's, it's, some would say it's kind of like the genie in the bottle. It's hard to get back uh, unless you really start to increase rates really fast. But then if you do that, you sure you'll get inflation, let's say down to two two to 3%, but you do it at the risk of really uh, dampening aggregate demand in the economy. Mm. And so now all of a sudden, you can have, uh, or you know, worse stagflation fears where em- employment is or unemployment is increasing and prices are still rising. So it's just a sticky situation that we find ourselves in, uh, or I guess America finds himself in, and, and to to degree uh, Canada as well, because we're kind of just like one and the same. And it's it's hard to say what the right answer is. Um, of course. In, in December, in the beginning of December, this all would have been fine. Then all of a sudden, Omicron hit and put more pressure on prices because there was more labor shortages, people taking time off because they're sick or now they're having to quarantine. So increase increased uh, prices even more. So what we all hope for is come March, April, May, the inflation prints that come out are more tame. They come back down to reality year over year. <clears throat> and maybe that doesn't happen until April. Because I think March was still a, a, a lower level of inflation last year. So year, yeah. over, year over year prints are going to be high. But let's say April, May comes around and inflation starts to tame itself down. Well, all of a sudden, that relieves a lot of pressure off the Fed. Um, as we talk here, the 15th and 16th, it's all but certain that the Fed is going to increase their rates by one notch, 25 basis points, um, it, almost certain. And so rates, raise, uh, you know, rates increasing by themselves aren't scary. Inflation by itself can it doesn't have to be that scary if you have tools to fight it, but mm. all three of them together in the storm is kind of the problem. Mm. Um, and so, what has really thrown a wrench into everything other than all printing all the money has been uh, the virus, um, because the virus has d- distributed demand and to be online, which is awesome, but then it also has not really subdued demand that off that that much. Like people had continue to buy like during the Omicron, like you're just buying online, right? So like Google had one of its record quarters uh, in quarter four. So, um, but, and then all, but the price, the more of more of the supply side, the prices had increased because there's no workers to fulfill your orders. There's no workers to build uh, stuff. And obviously the supply chains are screwed now with gas being so high or oil prices being so high as well. So it's just recession. I look at it as, um, not the end of the world. Uh, it doesn't mm-hmm. have to be. It doesn't have to be a monstrous recession. Um, people would argue with me and say that there's probably no recession. And to be honest, I'm not saying that there's going to be, but there's a. it's the probability of it is a lot higher than it was pre-Omicron, uh, I yeah. think. And so we'll see where it goes. But remember, I mean, recessions, the market is like, is trying to always price in everything. So who's to say what we had seen in terms of the stock market for a second is not just pricing in what it's going to see happen in the next two or three uh, months, or let's say one or two quarters to move up. Mm -hmm. So uh, remember, I think it's important to realize that the stock market is not the, is, is not the economy. Um, and fundamentals of a company doesn't reflect its stock price in perpetuity. They, They both deviate. And so, um, stock market has taken a huge hit. Growth stocks have taken a massive hit, like 70 or 80% for some growth, like actual legit growth stocks, like Zoom is down like 70%, Tesla's down yeah. like 40, 40 something percent. So um, who's to say how much of this is already priced in though? So that's kind of the yeah. dilemma that we face right now is like a macro market. And of course, yeah. Ukraine and Russia, which throws a wrench into, into everything because all of a sudden when you talk about nuclear war, none of what I just said matters. So Right, right. Yeah, that's that's the one thing like I'm, I'm curious. Like, if if everything that we're facing right now would have happened anyway without the Russia Ukraine thing. Like, if if because when you were talking about how Omicron really disrupted supply chains, like during the winter months, uh, at least in the northern hemisphere, right? The like it was so obvious because I remember like like the stores were like bare. Nobody yeah. was working anywhere. Like we try to go out to dinner. It's like, yeah, we can't <laughs> sit here because half our stuff, half our staff is sick. 
Yeah. And I'm thinking to myself, I'm like, man, I wonder if this is going to like hurt the economy in any way, you know? Yeah. And like how, the repercussions we're seeing now with like inflation going through the roof and like it has to be a direct uh, correlation to that. But but filling those um, those workers again seems to still be a challenge. Like I'm still seeing locally. I don't know if you're seeing this still at, at where you live in Vancouver, but like we're still seeing places where, you know, they're still trying to hire people like they can't still to this day find people and mm-hmm. i'm curious like is this just now the new normal and is this going to be part of what you're talking about which is just going to be the economy is going to have to re- figure out how to rejigger itself the free market is going to figure out how to allocate capital and how to allocate labor mm-hmm. so that it kind of comes to a balance and like the automation part of that also is going to it's very interesting to watch because if we're really going to get to a point where we have less and less people wanting to do some of these jobs and they're more remote or mm. they're doing things. Maybe they're taking time off, you know, yeah. and kind of pursuing their own things. And maybe we'll have a labor glut here in the next year or so. Like, how how do you think about that? Do you think the labor force participation right now is going to be where it's at? Or do you see it like rebounding or is there just a permanent shift? Have you have you given mm. any thought to that at all? Yeah, I mean, no, I'm, so I'm not a labor force expert by any uh, stretch yeah. of the imagination, but I, I think what you say is, is has has legs to it. Like people are again, like back to our, our our original points. Like people are questioning what they're doing, why they're doing it, and and more and more. So we're seeing frictional unemployment a little bit uh, in that yeah. respect, um, structurally as well. Um, but uh, but you know what's funny is like these like companies and and for enterprises today are so. Um, they're so awesome at pivoting. Like I've never seen the amount of, uh, like just a, a ability for a small business to pivot today. And I'll give you an example. I was picking up a food order from a restaurant uh, a couple of weeks back and I go into this restaurant, which I've passed by numerous times, but never been in. I go in and I swear it's not even a restaurant anymore. It's a factory. They've closed all the tables down. They have like five people like you know making food packaging food in the front making food in the back and they've turned their entire restaurant into like a factory for only uh pickups uh for uber eats or or like online food delivery so wow. it i went in and I, I pick it up my order and i'm like looking around I'm like don't there's like seats over here like that and on top of that, I was t- t- telling this to a friend. He said, yeah, like that restaurant's also done it. This one's also done it. So restaurants today are like, okay, yeah, I could hire three employees to be up all, all, all day and, and to ha- to do dinner service. Or I could just make 92% of what, of what I made before, but with 60% of the cost. Like people are realizing now that like, you know, and same with like Amazon or sh- Google shopping and stuff like this, like aggregate demand has, has continued to be decent. Like, so when we talk about labor shortages now and you talk about prices going up, like that's just, that's where the problem can be is like an amazing amount of credit given to small business to be able to pivot. But now there's going to have to be a period of almost pain as the market figures out how to reallocate labor, how to reallocate capital over the long haul. And so when we look at the markets, of course, people are having to go back to work more and more now. <laughs> it's actually like it's not even a joke. Almost like I think I think Jerome Powell almost like hinted at this. Like now that the markets are down, people are going to want to go back to work now because you know they're not going to see the nest egg and all this sort of stuff. And so maybe there's a degree of the Fed wanting to actually hit uh, equity prices uh, a little bit to interesting incentivize people to go back to work. So I, I mean that's a cruel way to do it, but you know that's that's one aspect that they probably look at in terms of maybe a little bit of the decision making. Uh, yeah. But, you know, I, but it's tough because this market has uh, infinitely more variables than it did four years ago, I think. Um, so projecting is like anyone's guess. We can just go off of what data we have today uh, and hopefully cross our fingers. We don't get uh, another variant, uh, even remotely close to what Omicron did in terms of it, not that it was very lethal, but it was yeah. just wiping out everyone in terms of like, having them quarantine or just be away from work. So, yeah. um, so yeah, who's to say what happens is so many more variables than, uh, anyone can feasibly predict from, but it's hard not to see prices, um, continue to go up here in the short haul as they have everywhere. And Tesla, by the way, Tesla has just increased uh, prices again today. Uh, I for, saw that dude. Yeah. What was it? A thousand. I just glanced through it. it was way more, way mm-hmm. more. Yeah. So if I pull up the one thread, um, it was they did, they did it the other day too, right? 
but but they 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 raised them again yeah so they did wow. it again very recently and then they did it again let me see if i can pull it up here sawyer yeah okay check this out dude it's like crazy mm -hmm. increases um model s long range went from 95 to 100,000 mm. uh plaid went from 130 to 136,000 so wow. basically <laughs> like the model s and x are up 5 to 10 grand wow. um the in, model x plaid sorry in a day in a day Wow. Yeah. Okay. Like Model X Plaid went up to 12.5. Wow. Um, and then the Y long range went up 3,000. Uh, and then performance wow. went up 3,000. And same thing with the, for the Model 3 as well. So these are like, and this is after the $1,000 price increase already. Oh and I wanted God. to pick your brain about this too. It's like, okay, so is this inflation? Is this demand? Like what? Mm -hmm. Like I, I, that, that was sort of on my, on my Twitter. I'm like, okay, like I don't know if it's going to be, like I'm mm -hmm. like inflation, demand, or both, right? Um, curious to hear your thoughts. It's it's definitely both. Uh, I would yeah. say it's eighty percent cost increases, twenty percent probably demand, <laughs> because I think it's a. I think Tesla is so nimble with their pricing, and they can be. Where like they just saw nickel hit. Like, it, did you see the short squeeze? Like nickel went up like like three hundred percent or something like that. Like nickel. Oh was shit! Just, really? Yeah, nickel was like the other day just had a massive short squeeze. Um, okay. So stuff like that has definitely will definitely affect prices. But you know what? Tesla has. The, because look, I mean, if you ordered a Model 3 four months ago, you're sitting on appreciation of what, uh, four, uh, four or 5,000 by now, right? Yeah, yeah. So now are you going to cancel your order? No, you're not going to cancel your order. You're going to be like, yeah, this is great. But let's say if you ordered, uh, if you wanted to order, if you wanted to order a Tesla and now all of a sudden you woke up to this news, are you going to bet? And my dad's kind of having this conversation. I don't know why he wants another Tesla in the family, but he, <laughs> yesterday was, it's an appreciating asset, bro. <laughs> that's, what, that's what he's arguing. And I was like, dad, stop. Yeah. Like, like, this is not an argument I'm going to have. <laughs> um, but he was like look, talking to me yesterday. He's like, okay, how much is the Tesla? Like prices are going up. He's like, well, if prices are going up, I want to order now because if I can lock it in, then all of a sudden if prices go up, I'm sitting on an appreciation, uh, appreciating asset like that. Yeah. Like that's, I'm like, that's not the way to look at this, but I can't help to think how many people do think about it that way right. um i personally hate it uh of course i don't want prices to go up but i hate it for the sheer fact that not only uh do prices go up it's just you know that friend that you have that likes to argue with you about payback periods on evs now all of a sudden used market sucks always has for teslas like you test used teslas are awesome as an owner because i can sell close to cost if not more today Yep. But they suck as a, as a new entrant, right? There's no like fifteen twenty thousand dollar used Tesla out there. Like all Teslas yeah. are, are pretty like they hold value really well. But that person that I'm arguing with, let's say, it's hard for me, harder and harder for me to make that argument in the face of like a ten thousand dollar price increase in the last six months, right? Yeah. So um, it sucks at a consumer level. Um, but of course, if Tesla is going to continue their gross margins where they're at, and undoubtedly Tesla is increasing their price by more than their cost. Why would you increase it by just your cost? If you right. know the costs are probably gonna go up a little bit after you announce anyway. So you have to assume some of this might be margin enhancing, uh, albeit probably not a long-term competitive moat, but yeah. demand, like who's gonna cancel their Tesla order now yeah. seeing all these prices. So all it does is reinforce people to wanna order their Teslas sooner or faster. Um, but by the way, I mean, a year and a half from now, if I watch this video, I was, pretty decent chance hopefully cross my fingers that tesla brings price back down right like so that would right. be and that's kind of like the tough question that we have to come across a little bit is like if tesla all of a sudden like you know supply chains ease up chips are everywhere and tesla announces like a seven thousand dollar off like talk about fud right fud mm -hmm. is going to go up the wazoo oh told you there's no demand told you like so it's going to be a fud it's going to be a fud storm when that happens mm -hmm. um so the only way Tesla really gets out of this is if they announce a smaller size, smaller priced car, like the 25,000 pre-inflation, 40,000 yeah. post-inflation <laughs> type of car. Yeah. Um, so, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's probably demand, but, but likely inflation, I'm guessing. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think I'm aligned there too. I think, I think what's going to be interesting to see is like once that, hopefully the, the, that, I guess deflationary sort of uh, or anti-inflation, whatever you want to call it, sort of an environment that we get into. My my guess is by that you know say that happens sometime next year. I think the bigger thing in the news is going to be auto industry is collapsing. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I'm like I'm curious to see how that headline is going to play into that because by then 
you would say that if supply chains have eased and then sort of the material costs have come down a little bit to where they usually are, mm -hmm. theoretically, the ICE car makers should have the same exact um, sort of lever to pull as well. But I'm curious to see if it's going to exist. And then the other thing we were talking about, too, with the inflation and Tesla prices going up, like how this is seems like it's perfectly positioned for full self-driving to completely dominate because of its because of what that what that means from a cost per mile perspective. Like talk about having a solution at what appears to be at almost the right time where you might have an environment where cars mm. are prohibitively expensive to mm. own, but then Tesla comes out with a solution with full self-driving where your cost per mile is like 10 cents or 15 mm. cents or whatever it is. Like ha have you thought about that in its current environment? Like we know, we know what it means full self-driving from a like, you know, it, it's going to completely revolutionize transportation, but I feel like mm. human beings usually behave when it comes to a cost thing, right? Like yeah. they're like, oh yeah, this is cheaper for me to do, great. So I feel like now we're in an environment where it might just be really expensive to own a car and if it's a gas car, you're gonna have to pay you know, six, seven bucks a gallon potentially here in the next year if this inflation thing doesn't slow down and we got these material shortages and whatever, commodities. Like I feel like full self-driving not only becomes a no-brainer from a safety perspective and an ease of use perspective, but now like the cost like people might just say, yo, I can't even afford owning a car and paying for gas. I'm just yeah. going to go into the death trap, quote unquote, of the full self driving. And, you know, if I get lucky getting to my destination, so be it. <laughs> but I wonder if, how big of a catalyst that's going to be for full self driving to fully take off where the alternative mm -hmm. is just so cost prohibitive. Have you thought about that? Does How no, does that sound? No, that's a that's a very astute point. I have I hadn't given that much thought, but it makes sense. I mean, if you look at uh, news articles today. Uh, or this week coming up, uh, coming out about how Uber drivers and Lyft drivers are saying, look, I can't, this is not making sense for me anymore with, with the gas prices the way they are. I'm not yeah. making any money. And so if they're not making any money, less and less Uber and Lyft drivers, what does that do to the price of a Uber or Lyft? It increases it further, right? So yeah. uh, until a market has a clearing period where now all of a sudden new Uber and driver, Uber drivers and Lyft drivers want to come in. So that's very true. The problem is though, of course, perfect time for disruption, but no one can rush innovation. Like however long full self-driving is going to take, it doesn't care about gas prices. Like it's just going to take however long it takes. Um, I like to take more of, of a subdued view towards timeline on FSD. I would love and Trust me, if I wake up tomorrow and I see FSD is on full on release, like I'm going to be giddy. Um, yeah. But I'm not going to put that as my expectation because I don't want to have that fall back and continually have to push it back. So I'm mm -hmm. almost thinking like twenty mid-2023, end of 2023 for a full wide beta release by then. But you're right. I mean, you talk about people lowering their bar, right, to, to get into an FSD car. I think that's a great point. Yeah. And I think, too, like it's going to pull out of pressure on the regulators as well. You know, whereas like if you had an environment where, you know, say gas was affordable and owning an ICE car was affordable, yeah. like maybe they're like, well, we got to be like, we need more data. We need more data. But then yeah. like if literally nobody can afford to own a car and go places, it might be like, okay, like, yes, let's just get, keep a really close eye on this. But yeah. yes, let's make this like you can do it. So I wonder if like that's, and the more I think about it, I'm like, holy shit, like it might be a setup for that. Like, do we have now a catalyst for full self-driving technologies to be approved way quicker than originally thought because the public literally can't afford the alternative, you know? Mm, I don't know. Yeah. I'd be curious to see how that plays out. It's probably a little too optimistic for me to think that way. And that's kind of like assuming that the trajectory that we're on for the coming year or so continues with inflation and all yeah. these things happening. But man, if that dynamic happens, like why wouldn't regulators be more like... Yeah they'll be incentivized to do this for their voting block because it'll be like, yo, like make this, I want to be able to get to work paying five bucks instead of freaking paying $30 for gas, right? Like it's it's a huge, huge. I don't know, we'll see. No, we'll see if that actually very plays good point. out. That's a very good point. Yeah, we can all hope. I mean, Elon says this here for level four, right? For yeah. Level, I mean, I think he might say level five, but I think level four, let's say this here is what he's hoping for. Yeah. It's, um, yeah, that would be huge. And we talk about like, uh, next level, like Elon says all, all the time, like next level unlocking of um, market value, that's going to be huge because now all of a sudden you talk about logistics, transportation, you exactly. can talk like any, like oh, it opens up so many doors. So yeah, exactly. it's huge, huge. Yeah. Yeah. I'm curious to see where that goes. Um, 
What are, what are other stocks? Um, oh, by the way, I know we're like an hour and 20 in. Like, do you have, uh, like, say, 15, 20 more minutes? Yeah, yep, we're good. Okay, I just want to yep. make sure I'm not hitting any block. I should have asked before I... <laughs> no, you're good. You're good. You're good. <laughs> I usually start talking and I can't shut up. No, no um, I like it. I like it. I appreciate that. The uh, What other stocks... Well, actually, let me start by saying, like, asking you this. Do you follow Palantir at all? Like, do you know anything about the company? I know a lot about the price action and, like, what okay. happens around there. In terms of specifics about the software... Not really. I had Tom Nash on the channel. He talked a lot. He gave a good rundown of it. Yeah. I feel like I'm not educated enough uh, on Palantir. I have some Palantir, but it's it's not a large portion. Yeah, but it's it's one of those stocks almost, right? Like it has the Tesla type audience behind it almost. Yeah. Like you don't see Nvidia channels on YouTube, right? Like it's mm -hmm. it's like Palantir channels, Tesla channels. So I'd love to learn more about it. If you if you if you know about it, you can explain to me. <laughs> I don't. That's why I asked. <laughs> like my thing has been like, I've been watching a lot of uh, content on it. Like there's a lot of you, like you said, like that YouTube community seems to be, uh, you can draw a lot of parallels between that and the Tesla community as well. Mm -hmm. But coming from the uh, business intelligence world and the data world, like the one thing I'm really struggling with and I'm actually having Tom, I was supposed to talk to him last week, but he had COVID. So I'm going to talk to him this weekend. But like I thought I really wanted to ask him about it. And I don't know if he's going to be able to sort of give it the insight that I'm looking for. But like, how is this any different than any other BI solution that has already been created? Like, mm -hmm. and we talk about like how AI is going to be. Oh, and full disclosure, I have some Palantir. I have a little bit in my IRA because it's like usually it, that's what forces me to look into a company if I actually buy it. If I don't buy it, I don't have any incentive to look into it. So like, Absolutely. I'm like, okay, a couple grand, let's figure it out. Right. So threw that in there. But the thing that I'm really struggling with understanding is, okay, so like the big thing they're talking about is how they're, they're, they're an AI company. Their AI is going to enable them to make the solution way smarter and way better for, for businesses to make better decisions and to see trends or whatever. Like that's what I'm understanding. But then Palantir also doesn't own their own data. Like they are not allowed to own the data. Like it's, they're just a platform. So how do you improve AI without owning the data? And that's where I'm like, that's where my head, I'm having some dissonance. Like I'm trying to understand how that, what that means, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I, I don't know if you have any information on that, but that's where I'm stuck to really understand, like, so that I, you know, what's the variable for me to shift more dollars into Palantir away from my other investments? It's that, it's okay, so what, how is it truly different from any other BI solution? And how mm -hmm. does the AI portion play into it if Palantir doesn't own its own data? Like, mm -hmm. I don't understand that. So I don't know I mean, if there's any insight you can provide on that, but. No, I, I, I wish there was. I'd be too ignorant to talk about it. But let me know what, uh, or I'll, I'll keep an eye out for on your channel for, yeah. for that interview. You should be good. Yeah, I'm yeah, curious yeah. myself. Yeah. Um, what, so what's the, um, what's your number two? I, I, I guess, is Tesla your number one, like sort of stock you follow? It, it's yeah, predominantly the only stock really. I mean, okay, that's not true because obviously I've got to follow the macro markets. I have buckets right. that I follow, but like day to day, if you, if I, if you could only tell me one stock price, all I'd really care about is Tesla. It's my number one. Um, <laughs> number two, I don't even know what my number two would be. It's just like so insignificant. I feel like to, mm. um, to day to day for me, um, I like following the macro markets as well because it gives context into what might happen uh, or it's just like an overall overarching thing. I used to like back when I used to day trade options and like be in the stock market and like, like, like I like to call it lose money for, for a profession. It was, mm -hmm. um, um, <laughs> it was, um, it was like, I, I'd want to follow like six stocks and know every single ticker and like what's happening and like exact price movements and remember them like, like almost like a Jim Cramer type but then the more I've kind of like, um, I don't want to say grown up, but the more I've kind of realized, like, it's not very significant to want, have to know all of the, of the minutia of every single stock you can just mm -hmm. follow one or two and really keep your keen interest on that. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's just mostly Tesla. I'll follow the macro markets, of course, like, like the NASDAQ, the SPY, the 10 year yield VIX, um, stuff like that. I'll follow, of course. And then I'll just look at buckets. So I'll pull up my like auto bucket look at how auto stocks have done today or high growth how's high growth done um gotcha. stuff like that gotcha so it's like you get your head wrapped around the macro markets and sort of the bigger picture and you try to draw a parallel between that and how test is performing against it kind of thing like you're trying to yeah. compare the two a little bit okay exactly got it exactly okay that makes sense that makes sense um are you optimistic about tesla's performance for the rest of the year 
It's hard not to be. I mean, what we've had a drawdown of <laughs> what twelve hundred to you know seven hundred ninety dollars in the first. Yeah. I think it's probably got to be one of the worst starts to the markets uh, to start a fiscal year. I feel like um, midterm elections are coming up, of course, at the end of the year. So midterms are always a a, a weird year for the markets. Uh, mm-hmm. But it's hard not to be. I mean, it's it's you talk about drawdowns. Tesla had a drawdown of forty percent. Like the question is, do you, what are the, prob- like everything's in probabilities, nothing's in absolutes, nothing's in black and white. The business is outperforming. Um, it will continue to, um, what are the, you talk about probabilities, what are the odds of another 20% correction from here versus having more upside? So I think upside is more likely here, um, than, than, than downside, at least just as least proportionally speaking, uh, of course, this all hooks on uh, the kind of the U- Russia Ukraine crisis and kind of what happened. Like no one had kind of seen this coming um, in January, yep. let's say. So, you know, barring that, barring big macro stuff, um, Tesla is probably going to do what twelve, thirteen dollars is kind of conservative uh, buy side estimates. Let's say uh, Tesla Twitter is kind of thinking fifteen dollars earnings per share this year. Fifteen dollars earnings per share this year. You know, give it whatever PE you want. Let me just pull up my calculator. You know. Yep. Right now, Tesla's trading at a 50 PE, a little bit over that. Uh, let's round down. 50 PE currently. Fit, like That's current, it? Well, $750 would give you a 50, a 50 PE. Yeah, so it'll, wow. It'll 55 or whatever it might be, right? So as we say here, that's what Tesla's current PE is. Not like, And so next year, let's say if they bring EPS to 30 bucks, like let's say if they double EPS because of the 4680s, you know, we're talking about like next year PE being like 30, like for, for a high growth stock that grew its deliveries 87% year over year, has two new factories, has margin enhancing technology imminent, um, has, of course, has key man risk, you know, to say yeah. the least. And now with Elon wanting to fight Putin, I guess, you kind, of <laughs> that, kind of take that to the next level. Um, who knows what happens in that judo oh match. God. He's so but, wild. It's nuts. Uh, and then, of course, but like, it's like, find another stock that is growing as quickly with as much of a mode as Tesla that has the earnings power to back it up t- today. Because if this crash had happened two years ago when Tesla was on the brink of like, oh, will they have enough zero emission vehicle credits to be gap positive this quarter? We don't know. Tune in to find out. If that's, if this crash happened then, Tesla would have been decimated. To, yeah. to the degree of like a Zoom had or a Zoom or a Teladoc or you know some of these growth stocks have been, so I'm really bullish on on Tesla EPS this year. Of course, chip shortages and next year, hopefully, crossing our fingers, first first year of like non uh, supply chain concerns. To talk about yeah. So it's hard not to be bullish on Tesla fundamentally, and and of course it's trading uh, at very cheap value. I think. Yeah, yeah. One of the things. When I spoke with uh, Dave Lee, when he had me on his channel, like the one thing I told him, and I think it was early this year, like one of my theses is that, you know, as the, because I still feel that like the market doesn't fully value Tesla's actual cash generation capability. Like they are, like their ability to create cash in a market, like, especially now where cash is going to become more expensive to borrow against. And then you have a company that's able to generate as much cash as Tesla is going to be able to generate mm-hmm. and its growth trajectory. And like you said, and full self driving on the wings, plus all the other stuff they're working on for future. And the mm-hmm. fact that Elon has a track record of executing, like how, how like the, the key man risk and the other like risks that they have in their mind as far as competition, like those must be like so high su- such a big part of their mindset yeah. that it's like it's blinding them from their other <laughs> perspective it's like it blows my mind i'm trying to understand like what am i missing here like it reminds me back of like 2013 and 2018 when the stock's getting completely decimated like what am i missing you know and and i think sort of what you're talking about is the way you framed it is such a great way of describing the story because it's i don't know how else to describe it and i'm trying not to be biased but it's like I don't see how that's not, I don't see how Tesla doesn't become like one of the largest, if not the most valuable company in the world in the next like year or two, if the trend continues because of just how much cash they're going to be able to generate and the advent of full self-driving, even if it's a year late, like you and I talked about it on your live stream. Like, I don't really care if it's six months or two years, like once that switches on, forget it. Yeah. Like forget it. So I don't know. It's, It's, it's weird. It's definitely that, 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 
I mean, blinding of Elon for sure is a thing that turns off a lot of institutional investors, not only yeah. them, but the big thing is for, for them is, is their clients. If their clients call them up and say, Hey, what's Elon doing? They, they don't want to be bothered <laughs> to have to He's explain. Putin, what? <laughs> exactly. Well, exactly. I mean, that's a classic yeah. example, right? If you're an institutional, yeah. um, um, big money manager, you're going to be fielding calls from your clients asking you about why Elon is doing what he's doing. And there's no wrangling Elon. So you would rather just be underinvested in a company like that because you save yourself ahead. It's almost like, you know, it's the employee mentality a little bit, right? Versus yeah. the entrepreneur mentality of maximizing cap cash flow. Mm. But I, I think the way to look at it as well is that the people that follow Tesla, uh, a lot of them, fun, uh, professionally speaking, let's say, are auto people, right? They, they follow auto stocks. So they're not used to giving huge multiples to companies. Why? Right. Because- you give huge multiples to companies that have huge EPS growth, like, uh, you know, Peter Lynch, like you talk about the peg ratio, right? Wanting to give, wanting to have a peg of one, meaning wanting to have the same PE as the same, as the EPS percentage growth. And so auto companies don't generally grow the way Tesla is growing all. And especially with the amount of, uh, the, with a few amount of capital Tesla is having to pull from like Tesla is really lean. Their return on marginal invested capital is very low as well. Like they are essentially have all, have all their fixed costs. Like they have the giga presses in. Um, now it's just a matter of of churning them out. Like that's that's really like Tesla doesn't have to keep reinvesting a large pool of capital to continue to build what they have. Uh, yeah. They're building something that you kind of build up once. Like it's like your computer station video, right? You build up everything, spend all this money on everything, and then you can make unlimited videos, right? Like it doesn't cost you a, another variable cost post the setup of your, of your studio. So yeah, that's kind of where Tesla's at. Auto companies are not generally given this much value because they don't generally grow this much and there's not a lot of disruption in auto. So, yeah. um, but also Tesla's on an auto company, right? They're, they're a tech company. They're an AI company. Um, they're a, a manufacturing company. Uh, they're an engineering co- Like they're, they're so many things all together that you can't bucket them in. And even looking at Tesla stock currently at the value it's sitting at, it's not even pricing in, in my opinion, just the amount of cars that they're going to produce, the amount of profit in 2025. So I look at FSD as like a cherry on top for now in terms of having to worry about being baked in the price, uh, robo taxis, all that sort of stuff. Of course, that'll help. Uh, but Tesla will do, let's say 5 million, 4.5, 5 million cars or have that run rate by the end of 2025. It's about $45 EPS, right? So mm-hmm. 50p on that is about two grand. Discounting that back, seven, eight percent discount rate, whatever you want to use, gets us to about 1450. I have to do the math 14, 1500, some 1600, yeah. depending on the discount rate back to present value today. That's kind of the way I look at Tesla. And so when Tesla was at $1,243, then we start asking, and you know, Gary Black talked about this a lot on Twitter as well. He's like, then you got to start yeah. asking yourself as a big money manager, how much do I scale back if at all? But then that's the question where you have to know the next step of Tesla with robo taxis. You have to know FSD. You have to know energy, which is not really making much money today. You have to know the yeah. next steps of Tesla to want to stay continually invested in Tesla post then. But at, sitting here at eight hundred bucks, that's not today's problem that we have to <laughs> we have to worry about. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. That's man. It's it's hard not to get excited. Like it's very reminiscent of when Apple. I don't know if, if you if you follow this back in the day, but like I remember because I just like looking at charts just for fun. Like I'm an idiot when it comes to this stuff, but I just like looking at like you. I'm a math person. My, I literally have a bachelor's of science and mathematics oh, from nice. Penn okay. State. So it's literally my background, nice. even though I'm terrible at it. I studied it. <laughs> um, that's what I always tell people is like, dude, I was like the worst student, but that's a story for another I was going to major in math if I didn't major in econ. That, that would have been Okay. Amazing. Okay. Yeah. I was I was aerospace engineering. And then oh, okay. I'm like, this is way harder than it's worth for me. Cause like, <laughs> I'm just trying to do something fun. And this is, this sucks. Like vectors, mm. what the hell is a vector kind of thing. Then I'm like, oh, I'm good at math. I'll switch over to math. And then math was like way harder. Cause at like, mm. at that like junior senior level, it's all abstract, you know, it's like, yeah. oh God, like what the hell did I do? So yep. um, anyway, that's a story for a different day. But I like, I like looking at charts and everything. And one thing that sticks out to me is like, Apple seemed to have a gigantic run from like, I can't remember exactly what it was from like 20, 2010, 2011. I forget what the chart looked like, but like for like multiple years, it was mm-hmm. like when the iPhone was really taking over and the iPad came out and the app store revenue started to come in. It's like year after year, bam, 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 bam. It seemed to like 
like forget what the freaking price action was, but like, <laughs> like right now, it feels like to me like the beginning of that run for Tesla because of all those different variables you listed. You have the car growth, you have the full self driving growth, you got energy, and these are all things that are like being worked on right now, and some of them are imminent, and some of them are just waiting for supply to clear up. You know, so it's like. Like this multi-year timescale for Tesla for the next, mm -hmm. like say three to five years, mm -hmm. looks so freaking exciting, and it's hard for me not to be super excited to the point where I'm like, God, like it, you know, again, I, I don't want to rehash myself over and over again. It's just it's hard for me not to be excited about where we are, man. Like it's, yeah. <laughs> no, it's, really, it's, it's really hard for me not to be so excited. Absolutely. You know? What well, by the way, yeah. one thing to just be careful with the Apple analogy. Yeah, Apple has, I think, I forgot what year, 2012, I think, they started mm. a share buyback and dividend program. So mm. the reason why I'm not, like, the reason why Tesla might have a hard time passing Apple and Mark Cap in the, in the near future is, first of all, Apple is like a beast, right? Three trillion or two point something trillion dollar Mark Cap. But they do consistent share buybacks uh, in the hundreds of millions of dollars, right? So, gotcha. so t Apple is a little bit of a different beast in that respect. That's not to say, by the way, I, I'm, I'm for the record, I'm on team Tesla do share buybacks once they start printing more money, let's say middle end of next year when they yeah. have so much money, they don't know what to do with it. Yeah, definitely start doing share buybacks, especially with with kind of some of the dilution that they've had previously. So, but with Apple, that analogy got to be a little bit careful because Apple buys back a lot of their, a lot of their shares um, gotcha. and, and then dividend growth as well can be reinvested. But, uh, but yeah, who's to say Tesla doesn't get there. Of course. I mean, Tesla, the, the reason why Tesla might be a little bit different is because Tesla's business is so much more capital intensive. You know, you yeah. need battery factories, batteries, um, you need more manufacturing, more gigas, XYZ, Apple, you're kind of just building phones and, you know, they're very small and you can just have a couple of big factories like Foxconn, but, uh, but yeah, no, it's, it's, it's exciting times for sure to say the least, I think, of course, yeah. albeit in the face of like absolute carnage in the stock market. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Crazy stuff. Um, all right. Should we play a little game to bring this, this sucker home All you know, right, for a little game? Sure. Let's do it. Okay. We're going to play the future game. Okay. okay. And so I'm going to ask questions. It's just a, it's just a few questions, small number of questions. And I'm curious to hear what your, uh, try to give as a precise answer as you can. Okay. Based okay. on these questions. All right. Um, so December 21st, or it's December 31st, 2022. Uh, what's Tesla stock price going to be on that mm. date? Um, now my answer is of course a little bit different than it was. Uh, if you asked me this uh, beginning of the year, yeah, I'm going to say 1374, not financial advice, just my guess. Okay. Got it. 1374. Very good. Um, <laughs> what's the, uh, inflation percentage going to be at the end of the year? Uh, year over year, probably like 4%, something like that. 4. So you see it coming down? Yes. Okay. Yeah. And how, how, like, what's your confidence percentage level there? Like it's high. It's, it's hard to see inflation continuing to like inflation. Inflation, uh, is like a derivative metric already. It's, it's the rate of change. So mm. we talk about rate of change over year over year, hard for mm. that to persist. Um, and I think we started to have elevated levels of inflation already, uh, end of the year or big end of the year last year. So I think year over year analysis of that shouldn't be massive. Okay. Got it. Um, I think you already answered this one, but when do you see full self-driving, like month and year, when do you see it becoming a reality? Uh, when you say reality, you mean like, like why? Oh, approved by regulators. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Uh, approved by regulators in what state? Um, any state in the United States. The first state. Um, yeah. I'm going to say middle of 2024. So June, 2024. I'm very, I'm very yeah. bearish on government uh, in general. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then... When do you think Tesla will become the largest automaker by volume? So number of cars sold. Uh, Volkswagen is number one, right? How many? What's yeah. how many units? How many units? I do think they do? it's thirteen million. Let me just double check on that. 13. Volkswagen, wow. something like that. Volkswagen uh, global car sales per year. We got because they own they own so many different brands. It's nine million. I think it might be Toyota actually. Toyota global car sales. Uh, yeah, so Toyota did 9.5 million in 2020. Okay, so, so let's say when does Tesla beat 9.5? Yeah, let's call it 10 because that's 2020. So that was COVID year. Okay. Um, 
Let me see if, uh, oh, there's a breakdown here by year for Toyota. Okay, what do we got? 20, oh, 2011. Yeah, let's call it 10 million. When do you think, uh, when do you think gonna, 10 million is gonna be breached? I'm at 20, let's say run rate of 10 million might be end of 2027, middle of okay. 2027. Okay. Okay, yeah. pretty good. I think I have them at, uh, I think that's exactly where I have them at, actually. If I look at my Tesla model, I have this thing that I've um, I shared with a bunch of people, like literally online, where I, I, I've kept a Tesla model since 2012. And I, oh, yeah? and I had a Reddit thread where I posted it, and I had a, a stock price prediction in 2020, back in 2012, uh -huh. of like, I think it was like $400 or $500. Uh -huh. like pre-split and people were like you're such an idiot blah 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 and i have like the reddit thing posted on my description like people were just <laughs> shitting on it and then like what i'm starting to notice like years later people are coming back and they're like oh this didn't age well with the comments like this guy mm. or whatever the early girl it was, that's it was hilarious. fascinating so that's it gave funny. me a lot of like conviction sorry Go ahead. that's actually hilarious i actually have the same thing i have a hell yeah from 2013 i have a tesla mo a financial model that i did it was terrible i showed it on a stream once probably not gonna show it <laughs> <up> again <laughs> juju gang do you want to see the model <laughs> Come on, bro. Come on, Juju Gang. Um, let me see. I have them at 10 million run rate, 2027. Yeah. So going nice. into 2028, I have them doing uh, 10-2 in 2028, which would have you know left them with a run rate at the end of 2027. So it seems and, like you and I are aligned. Yeah, yeah. And of course, this this can change based on robo taxis. If robo taxis come yes. out, then all of a sudden, you know, you might not see Tesla sell as many cars publicly. But yeah. Right. 2027. Right. That'd be good. Okay. Um, will there be a recession in 2022? Um, I can't sit on the fence for for this segment. I'm gonna say yes. Okay. Yeah, Got but it. I'm gonna say I'm gonna say one of the negative GDP growth quarters will be like barely negative or something. So barely it'll next. be like a it'll be like a textbook recession, but uh, Got it. nothing like a wait. <clears throat> Got it. Got it. Um, okay. And then so good job, well done. That was the future <laughs> game. And then uh, lastly, I always like to leave the uh, interview with like more of a philosophical question because I'm always curious to see how people think about sort of, um, uh, you know, humanity and everything like that. Uh, what do you think is humanity's purpose? Um, so broad. I know it is, isn't it? <laughs> I think I think humanity's purpose Um I think to glorify the creation that we are, um, you know, I think that means a lot of things to different people, uh, but to be able to glorify, you know, some people believe in God, some people believe in, in the universe and, and, you know, metaverse and all the, or not metaverse, <laughs> multiverse. <laughs> some people me. do. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Zuckerberg be, is God. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but, but, but to be able to glorify in what is humanity and, not to celebrate, but to be able to appreciate and to be able to do what one can do while we have our time here, Pro provide enough value, provide more value. I mean, we're only here for a, a snippet of time in the grand scale of the universe. And, and, you know, people don't even know who you are today. Like when you die, no one's really going to remember you at all. So, yeah. you know, the time that we spend here is precious and, and, um, you know, there's, I don't think there's one right answer to do what you need, but to be able to glorify your internal light, whatever that might be, and to just stay true to yourself. Because I think in today's society, not to preach too much, but in, to, in today's society, it's so easy to have to like want to fit into a mold or, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, I come from like a, I come from like a music background. I should be music or, you know, that's just do what you have most fun in. And that's usually a good light into finding out what you're, what you're meant to be here for. Dude, that's beautiful. Beautifully said, man. Yashu, thank you so much, man. I really appreciate you. Thank you the time, brother. Like, I really do. I feel like I, I have a very easy time conversing with you. I think we have a lot more in common than we think. It's like, yeah. that's one of the, kind of the vibe that I'm getting as I'm talking to you. Um, <laughs> you're welcome back anytime, dude. I would love to continue talking to you. Uh, you know, I definitely keep in touch and everything through Twitter and all that stuff. But yeah, anytime you want to come back, let me know. I'll probably ask you to come back at some point because I, I, you're like a great uh, resource for uh, one of my gaps in investing is like, I'm not a very technical person when it comes to investing. I'm much more like gut feel and like just trying to make like the obvious calls. But I think uh, somebody like you, and the reason why I like you so much is because you are a great resource when it comes to the technical aspect and really understanding the fundamentals of the company. And then also like like tracking day-to-day -day activities and seeing how, especially with Tesla and seeing how that plays out. Plus your freaking channel is freaking cool and it's got really good vibes. <laughs> and the Juju gang is freaking 
up there, man. They're, they're <laughs> awesome. But thank right you so on. much for coming on, man. I really appreciate you taking the time. Um, yeah, and uh, best of luck for the rest of the week and uh, keep killing it, brother. I thank appreciate you so much. Yeah, I appreciate, uh, appreciate the interview. Appreciate your time and uh, awesome job with the channel. I, I know Thanks, you're going to be... Uh, it, Soon enough, you're going to be up up at the top of the totem pole. Uh, on yeah, forget the, numbers. I don't care about numbers. <laughs> I'm just it's that thousand the thousand person rule thing essay that I got to read. Right? It's all about it's all about community. But I appreciate that, man. Thank you so much. Much love. Thank, Thank you. you, my friend. Take care. All right, all right, everybody.